Okay guys, so here we are in part two. Today we're gonna to be taking a deeper dive into understanding the cultural characteristics of the plant life that we're growing in order to grow our plants at their very best. Now in the first part of this series, we talked about sunlight, the size of the containers, and the temperature of our growing environment and how those three factors interplay in determining how often and how much we should be watering our plants. But today we're gonna to be talking about three different types of plants, in particular anthuriums, I'm gonna be talking about fiddle leaf figs and the Pilea peppermioides, the Chinese money plant, and understanding where these plants come from and how that helps us to determine the right conditions that we should be trying to give our plants in order to get the very best growth out of them. Okay, so Anthurium is a genus that is very special to my heart. When I was living in Colombia, I had the opportunity of seeing Anthurium grow wild in the rainforest and in the jungles, and it has made an everlasting impact on me. Um, it's one of the reasons why I have so many different beautiful Anthuriums in my house plant garden is because they bring me back those memories. Now, the very first thing that we want to consider when we're trying to figure out what kind of care we should be giving any plant is we wanna have an understanding of where they're from. Now, anthurium plants are native to the jungle rainforest of Central America and South America, pretty much along the equator line. And anthuriums exist naturally as an understory plant under the canopy of large trees and large shrubs. And in these areas, the temperature is pretty much even keel all year round. The nights don't get too cold, the days don't get too hot, and it pretty much stays in that range all year round, 365 days out of the year. Rainfall is also a constant feature of these areas, raining almost every day, if, even if just a little bit. Now, due to all these wonderful climatic conditions for growing plant material, there's a lot of competition. Lots of trees, shrubs, plants, all competing for that same amount of root space. And the final thing to note is that because they come from the area around the equator, the days and the nights are pretty much the same all year round. About 12 hour days and 12 hour nights, pretty much from January to December throughout the year. And a final component is that there's a lot of detritus decaying plant material on the forest floor all the time. Because there's always new plants growing and old, and old plants shedding their old leaves, there's so much old plant material on the forest floor that it creates a very chunky kind of soil structure, which allows for really great drainage always particularly because in these rainforest jungle areas, there's lots of mountainous areas, lots of hills and slopes, all of which adds to an incredible amount of drainage that happens naturally in these zones. Now, once you have a good understanding and visualization of where your plant comes from, then you can start to recreate those environments inside your home in your house plant jungle, like I do here. First, understory plant. That means it doesn't need to be growing in the bright southern exposed window. Save that precious real estate for your succulents or for other sun loving plants. These can really do well with indirect sunlight or simply a very bright location. That being said, they don't want to be too far away from the window, no more than about eight feet away from a window or a grow light in order to be growing at its best. A further thing to note is that because these come from an area with such chunky soils and such great drainage, we really need to recreate that by using a very chunky substrate. This is when it comes, this is when you have to get a, have a little bit more finesse into how you're growing your plants by creating the right substrate for your plants. I have a nice recipe for a soil substrate. You can check it out right there. But typically by adding things like orchid bark, perlite, charcoal into our potting mix, we're going to help to recreate that quick draining environment, which our anthuriums are used to out in the wild and which they absolutely need in order to thrive. Furthermore, because they're used to that continual rainfall, I keep mine pretty much just moist all the time. I really never let any of them dry out. And also because these plants come from the rainforest where the temperatures are pretty much even keel 12 months out of the year, I really ensure that they're growing in a location that doesn't get too cold and it also doesn't have too much variation between the day and the nighttime temperatures. I try to keep it pretty even all 12 months out of the year. 
And finally, because they're used to being in such great competition with other plants around them, I always keep them in small containers until they're absolutely exploding out of that container. Here you can see my beautiful Anthurium crystallinum, um, Crystal Hope. I have this in a pretty small container and I'm gonna leave it here until it probably has doubled in size from where it is now. We really need to create that competition in order for them to thrive. And what I mean by competition is that the roots will hit the edge of your container. And when they touch that edge of the container, that is kind of a signal to them that they're in competition and that they really need to grow if they wanna stay alive. So that's gonna help create even more top growth. A lot of times, if some of your house plants aren't growing optimally and they're just kind of staying still in their size, that could be because they're in too large of a container and they need to be down potted in order to really feel that competition and encourage them to grow. So by having a deep understanding of where they come from and how you can recreate those certain features in your home and in your containers and in your growing environment, then you can have great success growing whatever plant you may be struggling with. All right, so the next plant that I wanted to talk about is the fiddle leaf fig. I have three of them right here, here, and this guy that I propagated via air layering, which was a pretty fun process. Now this plant is actually native to the tropical areas of Central and Western Africa, very near the equator. This is an area that is punctuated with heavy rainfall at a moment's notice, but can also experience drought-like conditions for quite some time. Now out in the wild, the fiddle leaf fig can actually grow up to 100 feet tall and serve as a beautifully large shade tree. I saw a huge one when I was living out in Medellin, Colombia. But that's more of a rarity rather than the norm. They're typically growing in pretty fierce competition with other shrubs and trees in the area. And as such, they're used to fighting for soil space. But while they may be competing for soil space, the soil that they are growing into tends to be quite rich. Many of us have heard about the stories, how rich the soil is in Africa. And that is definitely what the fiddle leaf fig is used to. And now that we have a nice picture of where these plants come from, we can start to utilize that information into how we go about growing our plants. First of all, competition in the root zone like we just learned, small containers. Look at this. This is a nice sized plant in a pretty small container and I'm going to continue to keep it in this container until this is probably another foot in height. And also you can see this guy, this is about four feet tall in a nice little six inch pot. They definitely prefer to be grown in a very nice snug container rather than swimming in soil until they've reached a pretty good size. At that point, you can start to really give them a, a nice generous sized container. But you really don't wanna do that until you've given them a chance to fill out their container with roots. And the way that you can kind of understand and know if that has happened is if you start to find that your plant is drying out more quickly than it used to. Maybe it used to dry out every four or five days, now it's drying out every one to two days, and it's put on a lot of nice top growth. That's a good signal. Maybe it is time to transplant it. And noting that they come from the equator where the temperatures remain pretty even keel all year round and the length of day and night times also stay pretty much the same throughout the year, we want to ensure that we're giving our plant a very consistent temperature base all year round. They do not like being given cold drafts or experiencing very cold temperatures inside the home. So we definitely want to keep that in mind. And we also want to ensure that they have a nice consistently bright space. This is going to want more brightness than those anthuriums, and I typically will give them some of the best real estate in my houseplant jungle right next to the southern window, and I will keep it there all year round. And furthermore, since they're no stranger to heavy rainfall or to drought-like conditions, that tells me that I want to allow them a chance to dry out between watering. So I will give them generous watering, but then I'll give them a chance to dry out completely before I give them the next round of water. And as they are used to that rich African soil, this is a plant that I will never skip on fertilization. I definitely fertilize this twice a month, every month, all year round. And last but not least is the Pilea peppermioides, which you can see I have a nice family growing here of these plants. I love them. Uh, now this is a plant that's native to an area of the Yunnan province, a mountainous region out in China with a latitude similar to that of Washington, DC. Now in this mountainous region, um, it, the temperatures tend to be pretty mild all year round. It's not a mountainous area where that gets snow, but rather it is an area with a pretty consistent mild climate throughout the year. 
However, it definitely experiences days and nights that have a temperature differential um, that is notable. Cooler nights and warmer days, particularly when the sun is out, which tends to happen pretty frequently there. It really heats these plants up and they absolutely love it. And growing along these mountainous hillsides, the soil tends to be pretty rocky with incredible drainage. So translating that information into growing these plants, we know it likes to have a very porous, fast draining, gro uh, growing substrate. So I always tend to add lots of perlite into my substrate mix. You could even do 50% perlite, 50% potting soil, and that would be absolutely perfect. Since these succulent plants are used to having pretty intense sunlight, I always try to give them the more sunlight, the better. Definitely a southern exposed window. If not, give it some grow lights for added attention, especially during those winter months. As a mountain dwelling plant closer to those clouds, it's definitely no stranger to sudden thunderstorms or rampant rainfall. So I do not mind giving mine a deep watering when they are dry, but I do allow them to dry out between waterings pretty much 100%. That means I touch the soil and I feel it. And if I feel any coolness, any moisture, I don't give it any more water. I wait till it's absolutely dry to the touch between watering them. And finally, you'll note from all of my plants here that they're also in pretty small containers relative to the size of the plant. I want to have them really nice and confined in order to recreate that rocky setting that they're used to, where they are definitely in competition with rocks and absolutely living in a poor quality, nutrient low soil substrate out in the wild. So if you find that you have any particular plants that you may be struggling with, do this search. One of the best websites to find cultural information about where these plants are native to is the Missouri Botanical Gardens website. You can find just about any plant on their website and they'll give you a nice little list of where they come from. And once you start to have that idea, do some searches, look for images of the plants growing in the wild, recreate that visual scene of where these plants come from, and then translate that into the size of the container, the type of the soil, the amount of sun, the quality of the sunlight, the temperature, and the amount of watering. And once you start to really try to recreate those settings that they're used to out in the wild and have those settings recreated inside your home, I promise you, you will be growing happier plants. If only for the simple fact that by doing all of that hard work and all of the research, you're showing your plants lots of beautiful love and they will absolutely love you in return. Anyways, I hope you found this video a little bit helpful, a little bit insightful. If it did, definitely give it a like. Think about subscribing to our channel. Um, we're always posting videos every single weekend, new plant-related content every single weekend to fill your life with Mother Nature and all of her beauties. Also, think about sharing our channel to other plant lovers in your life so that we can continue to grow our plant community. And don't forget, if you have any further questions, leave a question in the comment below. I always do my best to answer and respond to every question and comment down there. Anyways, thank you guys for joining me here on Plant Vibrations. I'll catch you soon. Ciao.